Hi, so this is uh, the next lecture. Uh, this is the first lecture on chapter 20, Ecosystems and the Biosphere. And um, this is part one. So I'm gonna actually do this in uh, two parts. So we're basically gonna um, do three things here. We're gonna do energy flow through ecosystems. And technically we already did that. I feel like I covered this uh, when we, before we did the uh, trophic cascades and keystone species, because you sort of had to know that in order to do those. Um, we're gonna do uh, biogeochemical cycles and um, we are gonna do biomes, which I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on biomes, I don't think. All right, so just to review, um, an ecosystem is all living and non-living things. So it should have biotic and abiotic things in it. It includes that. Uh, ecosystems basically do three things. They capture energy and the way ecosystems capture energy is through photosynthesis. So they take CO2 from the atmosphere, water from the ground, and they make sugar. So that's how they capture energy. And then they transfer that energy through the uh, food web, and that is the 10% rule and, and the trophic levels and all that. Uh, but they also cycle nutrients, and that's those geochemical um, cycles. So uh, <clears throat> anyways, so they do make matter, and they make basically the first matter is sugar, and then they make other things out of that sugar, which we will do when we get to molecules. All right, uh, by the end of this first section, you should uh, describe the basic types of ecosystem on earth, differentiate between food chains, food webs, and recognize the port importance of each. And we sort of already did that. Describe how organisms acquire energy in a food web in a, and in associated food chains, and explain how the efficiency of energy transfers between trophic levels affects ecosystems. So we've sort of already done all this. I feel like I'll probably give you another assignment with this, but um, anyways, okay. So just to review this a little bit. So these are the trophic levels, right? So these are the primary producers, uh, which are plants. And then these are the herbivores. And then these could be the omnivores or the um, carnivores. And these could be omnivores or carnivores. And then this is the apex predator, which is the top predator. And you notice only 10% of the energy gets transferred up to each one of these, right? So if you have 100% here, only 10% of that energy gets transferred here. Only 10% of it gets transferred for here. Only 10% of that gets transferred here. And only 10% of that gets transferred here. And then the decomposers actually work at all the levels and they actually recycle the nutrients, which is those geochemical processes. And that goes back into the ground and then the plants take it up. And so the question is what happens to that 90% of energy that gets lost? A lot of it is lost as heat, um, but the producers do need sun to actually do photosynthesis. So that's the energy pyramid and the trophic levels and the 10% rule. And this is just from your book. So this is just showing you um, that energy flows this way, right? So plants are the only thing that can do uh, photosynthesis. So, uh, and then these are the primary consumers, herbivores, these are the secondary consumers, and, and this is salmon. So these are definitely carnivores. Um, so this is showing you how much energy, and this is the 10% rule here. So it's 10% of the energy, right? So producers have, 90% more energy than primary consumers. Primary consumers have 90% more energy than secondary consumers. And so the energy basically goes down, which means you can't have as many bears as you do rabbits or something like that, right? And this is a food web, which I, I will give you another assignment with this, but um, so, uh, but this is a food web and this is really showing you how energy flows, right? So energy gets fixed uh, in the producers, in the producers, which are right here. These are the producers and these are decomposers. So energy get fixed in the producers by photosynthesis and then that energy gets transferred. So the arrow is pointing this way. The energy gets transferred to the herbivores and then they get eaten by the fox and the owl and the energy gets transferred this way. 
So make sure when you make these, you have your arrows going the way the energy is flowing, right? And here's the same way, you know, and, and so the, this mouse here actually has three different predators, right? So the snake will eat it, the owl will eat it, and the fox will eat it. And then, um, uh, but all of these actually feed back into the decomposers, right? They poop, they die, they pee. So all that stuff gets uh, decomposed by the decomposers and then it gets taken up by the plants again. So you can see all of them actually feed into the decomposers. So you will make a chart similar to this. Okay, so um, so we have to have the sun because the sun because basically plants need light to um, plants need light to uh, let me go turn that off. Okay, so um, so we need the sun to actually do photosynthesis, and it also warms the planet and all this other, has important effects for the climate. Um, so the input is energy, which we get through the sun, uh, but you also need to, in order to make proteins and um, DNA and things like that, you also need nitrogen and potassium and phosphorus and things like that. So those are nutrients. All right, so energy flows through, right? So that's what I have up here. So energy flows through the ecosystem. So we have to have the sun to have a constant uh, supply of energy. But nutrients actually cycle. So they cycle through the ecosystem. And that's what um, ecosystems do is they actually cycle nutrients. Um, but matter cannot be created or destroyed and nutrients can only cycle. Energy flows through and nutrients cycle. That's what you need to know up here. So energy flows through ecosystems, nutrients cycle within ecosystems. And so the other question is, what actually does happen to that 90% that is um, lost? Uh, so organisms have to grow, so they need energy to grow. And 40% uh, is in cellular respiration. So in order to move around, you need energy and um, you have to move around. 50% is in waste. So that's basically, there's all kinds of things that can go here, but that's generally where the 90% goes. So it is really the cost of living. All right, so that's that part. Um, by the end of this section, you will be able to uh, discuss the biogeochemical cycles of water, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur, explain how human activities have impacted these cycles and the resulting potential consequences for Earth. So um, I'm gonna, not going to, the, the ones I'm going to spend the most time on is the nitrogen cycle and the carbon cycle, and I'm not actually going to include the carbon cycle here. So... Um, so first thing we're going to do is the water cycle, which I don't have. It. There it is. So the water cycle. And um, here is a video here that you can uh, watch. It's a short one, but it's, it's a pretty good video. It's not very long. Uh, but so the water cycle, you know, flows between the atmosphere, the oceans and the land. So you have groundwater and that and then you have evaporation. So here's evaporation and then it condenses in the atmosphere. And then it rains, so uh, it rains. Precipitation is rain. And then you have surface runoff that runs into the oceans and you have groundwater discharge that runs into the oceans. And then you have evaporation and it goes around. So everybody should be fairly, fairly familiar with the water cycle. You can also watch that video up here. Um, and uh, one thing that is important here is transpiration, which they actually don't show here, I don't believe. They don't show that here. So trans here's evapotranspiration right here. So actually in the summertime, particularly in the summertime for deciduous ones, they, they lose water, right? But, um, oh, so let me finish this, I'll go back up to this. So this is uh, almost all of the Earth's water is salt water, and only 2.5% of that is fresh water. And of the 2%, 2.5%, 69% uh, 
is actually in glaciers and permanent snow cover, which is actually decreasing because of uh, climate change. And 30% uh, is in the groundwater and only 0.3% is in lakes and rivers. So the biggest, uh, almost all the water on earth is salt water. So uh, a big uh, important thing is transpiration also is here and that's important because trees actually, or plants actually take water up through their roots, but the leaves up here need water to do photosynthesis. So they need water and carbon dioxide to make sugar. That's what photosynthesis does. So the question is, how does the water get from here all the way up here? So if you think of a hundred foot tree, the tree has to move water all the way up a hundred feet in order for the leaves to get water to do photosynthesis. And the way they do that is they have little holes, usually on the bottom of the leaf and they're called stoma or stomata. And so this shows you that the, and we'll eventually do water potential problems, but I'm not gonna do it here. Uh, but the water gets taken up through the soil and water sticks to itself and it sticks to other things. So actually wood is just a series of tiny straws and it's called xylem. And it's gonna move that water all the way up here. And eventually the water is gonna move out the stomata and the, the plant can actually open and close these. So if it gets too dry, it closes them because it can't afford to lose water. But if it opens them, it basically, this is like a big straw that's pulling it up and this is where it goes out into the atmosphere. And that's when it can do photosynthesis generally. So these stomata are actually good. So if you think about the Amazon rainforest where it's warm and it's wet, they can do an incredible amount of transpiration and they do. And I'm gonna to try to show this video here. Writing's not that easy, but Grammarly can help. This sentence is grammatically correct, but it's A tropical rainforest without rain wouldn't be much of a rainforest. I mean, all plants need water to grow, and without it, they shrivel up and die. So what about the ancient Hawaiian proverb, hahai no ka ua i ka ula ao, which means the rain follows after the forest. How could that be? Well, all land plants lose water when the pores on their leaves open up during photosynthesis, and this evaporation draws more water up through their stems. With so much rain soaking the soil in rainforests, water is nearly unlimited. And accordingly, rainforest trees can afford to move and lose more water than other plants. All that water vapor rising from the forest feeds moisture-laden clouds while also causing convection. Together, these effects accelerate the formation of rain, which falls to the soil and gets taken up all over again. This cycle of absorption, evaporation, and rain happens everywhere there are plants. However, super wet soil, fast pumping trees, and hot tropical sun make the cycle so fast in the rainforest that unlike other biomes where clouds might form in one place and rain in another, in a rainforest, all that water stays in the same region. Without the forest pumping so much water into the air, rainforests wouldn't be as rainy. And without so much rain, the forest couldn't pump so much water into the air. So which came first, the rain or the rainforest? Well, before rainforests, ancestors of trees like cypress, pine, and spruce dominated the land, but they were conservative when it came to using and losing water, so the air tended to be dry, meaning less rain. However, around 130 million years ago, a new kind of plant developed that took the risk of losing more water in return for souped-up photosynthesis. These were the flowering plants, and their risk paid off. Their faster growth enabled them to outcompete the ancestral pines and take over the tropical regions of the globe. These angiosperms lost so much water into the air that as they spread, they brought their own rain with them. And today, tropical rainforests receive more rain than if they were pine forests. In some places, as much as a meter more rain each year. That's equivalent to an extra two and a half hours of heavy rain each week. Not surprisingly, all that water cools off the forest too, which is why the Amazon isn't nearly as hot as the Sahara or even an East Texas pine forest in summer. But the hot, dry tropics of the past may soon be a part of our future. In parts of the Amazon where vast swaths of rainforest have been logged or cleared for agriculture, unusual droughts are already occurring, and forest fires have become more frequent. Scientists worry that these changes will lead to ever hotter, drier, and more flammable tropics in the coming decades, making things tougher both for the remaining forest and for the people who live there. So when in drought, plant a tree. Seriously, hahai no ka ua i ka ulula ao. This episode of Minute Earth is supported in part by Cookie Blast, one of our subscribers on Subbable and also a puzzle game available for iPhone. Okay, so um, so that's so the rainforest actually 
produces its own weather. And uh, so it, it actually isn't the lungs of the planet. It actually uses all the CO2, but a lot of that rain does get moved out into the ocean. And so the rainforest is really important for actually our water cycle. It's extremely important for the water cycle and the Amazon's being cut down. So, and that's the biggest rainforest we have in the world, which is in Brazil and things like that. So the other thing I was sort of wanted to talk about was the Ogallala aquifer, which is in the plains, right? So this is the aquifer, it's underground and it used to be whole, it held more water than like the Great Lakes or something like that. But this is actually very dry, right? Let's see how I thought I, I thought I had that. In, oh, it must be down further. Okay, but it is very dry here, uh, and this is the grassland. So there's basically you have grasslands where it's too dry to have trees. So the way they can have agriculture that looks like this is the uh, the, uh, the aquifer. So basically, they have pumps, and they pump up that water from the aquifer. And this is why this is how you get this. So it's really flat there. It's flat grasslands, but this is all man-made, right? So basically, what has happened is they're over, they're empty in this groundwater faster than it can be replenished. And so every year they have to build di deeper and deeper pumps to get down into the water. And you know they're really destroying that aquifer. So because they're doing that, the land is actually sinking because the water isn't holding up the land. There's all kinds of issues with that. But that is why we have, that's the bread basket and the corn basket. We grow an incredible amount of coin and soybeans here and we ship them to China. Anyways, all right. So uh, so that's the water cycle. That's all I'm really gonna say about the water cycle. Um, so this is the phosphorus cycle. And basically the phosphorus cycle, it originally eats from the rocks. So phosphate is in the rocks and then the rocks get broken down, broken down, broken down. And eventually it gets into the plants, take it up and then it goes through the plants. And phosphate is generally uh, PO4, three minus, it, it is an ion. And um, basically uh, the reason why you need phosphate is to make nucleotides and nucleotides make up your DNA and RNA. You also need phosphate to make your cell membrane. So your cell membranes are made up of phospholipids and phosphate is also important for ATP so that's uh, adenine triphosphate, this P means phosphate. And that's basically the energy, energy currency of your cell. So you eat sugar, but then your mitochondria takes that sugar and it breaks it down to make ATP. And ATP is sort of uh, what your cell recognizes as energy. Um, just, so generally phosphate also is important for flowering, to flower. So if you like roses, they feed them phosphates. If you want, you know, your you want your plant to have a vibrant flower, you would um, fertilize it with some phosphate. But it does originate here from the soil. And I just wanted to show you this. So the bluegrass region of Kentucky, so Lexington is right here in the middle and Louisville is over here somewhere. Um, but Lexington is right in the middle of the inner bluegrass. So this is the bluegrass and it does have limestone bedrock but it's actually high phosphatic limestone, which means it has a lot of phosphate in it. And that's really one of the main reasons why the horses are here. Um, so this is all limestone fences, right? These are all limestone. Um, so basically in the spring, when you get this, all this rain, the grass gets this flush of phosphate and it makes it look uh, blue green. And this is why it's called the bluegrass. So, um, but that, that's the idea. So they used to raise cattle here and I think the main reason why the horse farms are here is most cattle production move further west where it's flatter. So this is not real flat here. So it's it's hard to do big agriculture. Anyways, so that's the so it so we do have high phosphatic limestone here, which was also good for um, for whiskey, and it was also good for making um, I can't remember what I was going to say. Oh, tobacco. All right, so this is the sulfur cycle and I'm not gonna spend much time on this at all. Um, but the sulfur cycle is, it actually, you need sulfur to make some amino acids and to make protein. So you make those disulfide bridges that has sulfide in it. And again, this originates from the soil and, um, and volcanoes. So when we went to Hawaii, we went to the uh, big island of Hawaii where they had that active volcano and it smelled a lot like sulfur smells basically like rotten eggs. 
So that's where sulfur, that's why sulfur is important. Okay, so it does smell like rotten eggs and these vents come out and they do smell like sulfur. Okay, so um, the nitrogen cycle basically um, is more complicated. And um, so there's nitrogen gas in the atmosphere. I'm actually gonna, and uh, I'm actually gonna go down here a little bit. All right, so nitrogen N2 is nitrogen gas and it actually has that triple bond. And so that's a really strong triple covalent bond. So it's hard for plants to break that and they can't break that bond, plants can't. But it's actually 78% of the Earth's atmosphere. So here it shows you here. So this is the Earth's atmosphere. 78% of it is actually this nitrogen gas. But the plants actually can't take that up. So they can take up CO2 through their stomates, but they do not take nitrogen up because they can't break that triple bond. So plants need another way to take up that nitrogen. And how they do it is they actually take it up through their roots uh, and it's dissolved in water, but they actually can't take up nitrogen gas. They take up ammonium. This should be a negative one. That's wrong right there. And um, this is nitrate. Um, so why do you need nitrogen? You need nitrogen for amino acids. These are the amino acids over here. So you have, so you can see all the nitrogen in here, right? So there's nitrogen, you're, you're actually, your, your amino acids are actually filled with nitrogen, DNA and RNA. So that also has, a, this is that, and then amino acids have a lot of nitrogen in them and ATP also has nitrogen in it. So nitrogen is considered the most limiting um, nutrient of plants. So if you give a plant nitrogen, it's gonna do much better. Okay. So the question is, how do the plants take up nitrogen if they can't take up N2? And the, and the um, answer to that is bacteria. So bacteria is extremely important to the nitrogen cycle. And without it, plants put, basically could not take it up. So basically you have atmospheric nitrogen and that atmospheric nitrogen actually gets fixed, right? So you have nitrogen fixing bacteria it moves nitrogen from the atmosphere into the soil. And so here's a nitrogen fixation and here is nitrogen fixation. And um, so basically these, uh, if you have legumes like, um, like peas are legumes, uh, soybeans are legumes, any kind of bean is legumes, they're generally high in protein because they're high in nitrogen. And they're high in nitrogen because they have these nodules on their roots that actually fix nitrogen and they fix it in the form of ammonium. And then there's also bacteria in the soil. So, right, so now we're in the soil. So there's also bacteria in the soil that will also change it from N2 to ammonium. And to some extent, plants will take up ammonium. They will, they, they prefer to take up nitrate, but they will also take up ammonium. Okay, so now we have ammonium. And then, um, so now what you're gonna do is you wanna change it from nitrite to nitrate. And this is really what plants, this is the easiest thing for plants to use is nitrate. So you're gonna do that with um, nitrifying bacteria. And this transforms ammonium to nitrate. So now you have ammonium, it's gonna change it. This is a nitrifying, these are all different types of bacteria as well. So there's different types of bacteria. They're all very specialized. So it's gonna change it from nitrate to nitrate. And this is how plants are gonna take it up. They can take up some ammonium, but they prefer to take up nitrate. And then you have denitrogen back bacteria that's gonna move the nitrogen from the soil back to the atmosphere. And this is denitrifying bacteria here, bacteria here, and it's gonna move it back up into atmospheric nitrogen. So that's how it moves through the soil, and think, but it requires bacteria and there's you know, hundreds of different types of bacteria that actually do that. So then the question is, how does it, how do you get nitrogen? So you get nitrogen through plants, right? So you eat plants or you ate something that ate a plant. So a plant will take up ammonium and nitrate and it has to be in the soil and it has to be dissolved in water. And the plants are gonna use that to make uh, proteins and DNA and RNA and ATP and all that stuff. And then you're gonna eat that plant and that's how you're gonna get your nitrogen. 
but you also are going to, when you die or when the tree dies or when you poop and pee, you actually poop out nitrates. And then that's where the decomposers are going to break it down and they're going to make break it down into ammonium. And then that's going to filter through that way. So I will expect you to know a little bit about this, right? I would expect you, and uh, there's a video here as well. Um, I would expect you to know that the nitrogen cycle is really driven by bacteria and there's different types of bacteria and, you know, it's a triple bond. So plants can't take it up through their stomate. They actually have to take it up through their roots. In order to do that, they have to have these uh, bacteria that actually break it down. All right, so if you go buy fertilizer in, you know, Lowe's or Walmart or Home Depot, it generally has these three numbers on it, right? So the first number is the amount of nitrogen. The second number is the amount of phosphate. And the third number is the amount of potassium. So I already told you that this is the most limiting nutrients to plants. So they can come in different numbers, right? So this is 15, 5, 10. This has a lot of nitrogen in, no phosphorus. So you wouldn't be giving this to a rose bush because you would give this probably to a non-flowering plant, like corn maybe. And, um, and this is potassium. Um, but the nitrogen is actually important for plant color and growth. Phosphorus is important for flowers and fruit. So you want to give your tomatoes and everything you want to eat a high phosphorus. And then potassium is for strong roots. So this is important for like grasses and things like that. But those, we, we're not actually going to do potassium here, but we did phosphorus and this is nitrogen. Okay, so humans have greatly altered the nitrogen cycle. Um, so um, basically we add nitrogen outside to the atmosphere from vehicles and that is acid rain. Um, we are also contaminating groundwater from nitrate ions in organic fertilizers. So the big thing is inorganic fertilizers. And that was really the boost of uh, industrialized agriculture. So basically they can take ammonium nitrate and you can also make bombs and stuff out of that. And that's what they, but it's inorganic because it doesn't have carbon in it. And then you put that on the ground and then your plants grow more. The problem is it gets, it gets washed off into the groundwater and into the oceans and things like that. So also when you burn trees, you, um, or cut them down, but it also releases nitrogen into the atmosphere. Okay, so this is showing you um, Chesapeake Bay, and this was affected by uh, phosphate and nitrate runoff. And that basically does come from fertilizers that farmers use, or they made fertilizers or things like that. So they are trying to restore a lot of this Chesapeake Bay. But this says um, dead zones occur when phosphorus and nitrogen from fertilizers cause excess growth of microorganisms, which depletes the oxygen and kills the fish. And so these are the dead zones. And there's a big one right here in the Gulf. And that's where the Mississippi River dumps and all along the East Coast. And then here's some in, um, in Europe. And then here's some off the coast of China. Um, but the Mississippi River, there's a big dead zone around the Mississippi River. And this is basically from the farming that happens up here in the Midwest, right? So the Missouri River runs here, and then it runs into the Ohio River, and the Ohio River dumps here. Uh, the Ohio River dumps also it runs this way, and it also runs into the Mississippi. So all of this agriculture that gets done in the Midwest basically flows into the Mississippi. And that's why you have this big dead zone where it actually hits the ocean. All right, so the next one is going to be um, the carbon cycle. And I'm going to skip this here because we're actually going to talk about um, climate change when we talk about carbon cycle. So I'm going to do put that in a separate video. OK, so uh, 20.3 is uh, terrestrial biomes. Um, so by the end of this section, you'll be able to identify the two major abiotic factors that determine the type of terrestrial biome in an error area. Uh, recognize distinguishing characteristics of each of the eight major terrestrial biomes. So the two major abiotic factors is basically when we looked at that climatogram in that um, biome viewer, and that was precipitation and temperature, right? 
So if you if you have uh, cold winters and warm summers, you're basically temperate. If you are if your if your temperature doesn't change over a long time over the year, you're in the tropics. And I'll show you that in a minute here. All right. So a region is a region with similar climate, uh, which is weather and temperature, and plant types, and then also geographic region. So this determines whether you're temperate or um, temperate is further away from the equator and tropical is close to the equator. There are three types of biomes, marine, saltwater, which is saltwater, freshwater, and terrestrial. Um, so these are the eight um, biomes, and this is the equator. So basically tropical forests are found within the tropics, right? This is, I think, the Tropic of Cancer, and this is the Tropic of Capricorn, and this area here is considered the tropics. Um, and generally you find deserts along these. So here's the Sahara Desert along this tropic here. And yeah, this is desert right here. And you generally find deserts along here, right? Here's Australia. And that's where you find deserts. You generally find deserts there. And then the further north you go, you're gonna find temperate, right? So you find temperate forest and temperate grasslands above and below the tropics, basically is what you do. All right. Um, but most of the Earth's landmass is in the Northern Hemisphere, right? So this is the equator. So there's a lot more Earth biomass above the equator than there is below the equator. And I'll just show you this. This is the Tropic of Cancer, and this is the Tropic of Capricorn. So this area here is considered the tropics, all right? So this is where you would find tropical uh, biomes, and up here and down here is where you would find temperate biomes. So uh, this is something I think that they actually ask you in that biome viewer, that there is sort of patterns. So around the equator, you're going to have a tropical um, rainforest. And as you move first, you're going to have a temperate forest. Uh, we live in the temperate deciduous forest. Uh, the next biome you're going to get to is the taiga or the boreal forest. So this is mainly uh, coniferous trees like um, pines and spruces and hemlocks and um, uh, I can't think of anything else. But anyway, so that's taiga. They're all basically um, gymnosperms. These are gymnosperms. And then you're gonna get to the tundra, which is above the tree line. And that's where like the uh, reindeer and stuff live. And then above that is where you get polar ice. So there's actually sort of a pattern of of uh, biomes as you move from the equator to the North Pole. And then you uh, you see a similar pattern uh, in elevation, and this would have to be a taller mountain than say the, um, the uh, Appalachians. So this would be somewhere in the tropics because at the bottom you would have the tropical rainforest. And then as you moved up in altitude, you would have the temperate forest. And then if you move further up, you would have the taiga, which is the gymnosperms. And then this would be above the tree line. So the tundra would be above the tree line. And then at the very top, you would have glaciers. Like you would see, well, you wouldn't have tropical rainforests in the Rockies, but it would start here and move up. So I think the, um, the Appalachians only go up. I think at the top of the Appalachians, there's only uh, Taiga uh, because those are really old mountains and they've been worn down uh, where the Rockies are still getting bigger. Okay. And this is a climatogram, and you should have already seen this in the um, biome viewer. And so this is um, this is temperature, right? And so you know this is temperate because it goes up and down; it's not flat. So in so this is June, July, and August. So they have warm summers and cold winters, and actually it looks like they have most of their rain in late summer, early fall. So that's this is a climatogram. And this is just shows you different ones. So just looking at this, you would say that these two, you know, are tropical, right? Because their temperature actually varies very little through the year. So, you know, these are tropical. Um, this is probably more temperate. This is a lot more temperate than say this one, right? So this one is actually probably 
this is a polar grassland, right? And this one is, what was, what's this one? This is a, a temperate desert. This is in Nevada. Uh, so anyways, this is a tropical desert in um, Saudi Arabia. So the temperature doesn't vary a lot. It's pretty tropical, but it gets very little rain. So it's a desert. Um, so this is um, a tropical rainforest here. Well, this is the freezing point. No, it's not a tropical rainforest. Where is it? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. So this, this would be a tropical rainforest, I believe. So this is um, never gets below freezing and it gets lots of rain. So here would have a monsoon season. So it gets lots of rain and then it has a dry season right here. Um, so this is very dry. This one's very dry. All of these are very dry. These are more wet, right? So these have get more, get more precipitation than this up here. So that's sort of how you read climatograms. And this is um, a graph that sort of shows you how they fall out according to rainfall. So here is where it's wet and here it's where it's dry. And this is temperature. This is where it's hot and this is where it's cold right? So generally you find deserts where it's pretty dry, but actually you can have hot deserts and you can have cold deserts and tundra is basically a cold desert. Um, so, um, and you can also have the taiga here, but these trees are very slow growing. They're not, they don't grow very fast. And as you get wetter, right, you're going to get grasslands, but it's still too dry. Grasslands, it's still too dry to have trees. So if it gets a little wetter, you can have savannas, which are still considered grasslands, but they do have some trees. And here's where you have the temperate deciduous forest. And then if you get more rain, you would have a temperate rainforest, which is where those giant sequoias are out west. And the um, California redwoods, that's, that's the temperate rainforest. Then you can have the tropical deciduous forest, and then you can have the tropical rainforest is actually where it is the warmest and the wettest, and that is around the equator. So they actually produce their own rain here. So these are actually self-sustaining, unless you cut them down, which we're thought what we're doing. Okay, so the other thing I do sort of want you to know is primary productivity. And primary pro productivity is the amount of photosynthesis that gets done in the um, ecosystem. And so the more plants you have, the more photosynthesis you do. So it's really how much carbon is fixed into the environment. And as you would know, the tropical rainforests do a lot of photosynthesis because they have a lot of sun, they have a lot of water, and they can do a lot of photosynthesis. So they're highly productive. Coral reefs are also highly productive and wetlands are also highly productive. So this is where we live. We live in the temperate deciduous forest. It is pretty productive, but not as productive as these over here. Then you have grasslands, which are less productive because it's too dry to actually support trees. Here's lakes and streams. Here's beaches. Uh, tundra is basically a cold desert. Deserts are not productive and open oceans are not really productive. And actually whales, I guess, have an important, uh, important role for that one. That's a trophic cascade. So basically the whales poop on, on the surface of the water and they make this phytoplankton and then it moves through the food web. And this is just another picture of that. So open ocean is not productive. Here's the coastal zone. Wetlands are highly productive. Tropical rainforests are highly productive. Here's intensive agriculture, but that is all um, man-made, right? So we give it, we give it, um, we irrigate it with water. We give it um, fertilizer, inorganic fertilizers or man-made fertilizers. Here's temperate deciduous forest. Here's the coniferous forest or the taiga, grasslands, tundra, and desert. So that's primary productivity. And that has to do with this, right? So you're talking about primary producers. So the more energy you have at this level, the more levels you can have here, right? So you can only have enough levels here until you run out of energy. And so if you have lots of energy here you can support more levels here if you don't have very many much here you say like the tundra the tundra can only probably support three trophic levels the tropical rainforest can produce probably at least six of these 
right? So that's the idea of primary productivity produces how much energy you have here at the beginning of the food web. And according to the 10% rule, that, that, um, that sort of determines how many trophic levels the food system, the food web can support. I forget what I was gonna say about that. But basically these are more productive and these are less productive, right? These are the most productive, these are the least productive. Okay, so ecosystems can vary in size and it really depends on what you're studying or what you're looking at. So this is a little tidal pool that becomes apparent at low tide. And when high tide comes in, it sort of gives it a fresh flush of water. And this is a um, this is a um, this is an Amazon rainforest. This is a very large ecosystem. So ecosystems can be different sizes. And I'm just going to go through these a little bit. Um, so deserts can look very different. Um, so um, this is the Saguaro National Park. This is the Saguaro tac uh, um, cactus, and um, this is a uh, desert in um, Africa. So this really has no plant life per se. So deserts can look, they can be hot, they can be cold. You know, I think a lot of things people say, you know, if you survive the heat of the desert, the night is going to kill you because most deserts gets really cold at night. And so a lot of people actually die of, you know, hypothermia at night because it gets so cold. Um, this is the Saharan desert. So this is actually the biggest desert in the world, and this is actually getting bigger. Um, and this is actually right here where the desert meets the tropical rainforest. This is actually where our hurricanes first form. So the hurricanes come off of this right here, and then they go over and across the uh, Atlantic Ocean, they go into the Gulf, and that's where we get, this is where our hurricanes actually originate from is right here, this area right here. Um, these are the, actually the deserts in the United States. So we have the Great Basin Desert, the Mojave Desert, the Sonoran Desert and the Chihuahuan Desert, and they all do look different. Um, so this is the Chihuahuan Desert. Uh, so anyway, so this is the picture of the Chihuahuan Desert. Uh, this is the tropical rainforest. So this is one of the most productive biomes there is. This is the near the Amazon River. The Amazon River flows through it. Um, these are grasslands. So savannas are basically grasslands, but they do have trees in them. And the tree that you sort of see most is the acacia tree. That's what people look, but this is in Australia. Uh, we also have North American grasslands. And so these are the grasslands and you actually, so here's the Rocky Mountains, right? And here's the ocean over here. So the water comes here, but it actually can't get over, there's Sierra Nevadas and stuff over here too, but the water can't get over the, the Rocky Mountains. So it's actually greener on this side. So over here, it's really dry. So it can only support short grasses. And this is uh, Northern Mixed Prairie. And then it, it sort of gets a little wetter and then it has a mix. So these are a little bit taller. And then this is where it's a little bit wetter and this is the tall grass prairie. So this is where you have uh, big blue stem and these tall grasses. Um, so this is actually, and this is where the bison herds used to travel. The American Indians, they moved them all out there. But this is where the bisons, uh, we used to have huge populations of American bison, but we killed all them. And then, um, but anyway, so what has happened to this? This is almost completely gone. I think there's less than 2% of that gone. This is really, and this is where the Ogallala aqu aquifer is. And this is what it looks like now. So it is no longer grassland. It is completely man-made and been, but they are using up all this water and they know they're gonna be out of water eventually. So it is not sustainable. This type of agriculture is not sustainable. Okay, this is chaparral, and this is what is burning out west. So um, it is considered a Mediterranean climate. So people like to live there for the climate, but chaparral is actually set up to burn. So a lot of these shrubs and stuff have uh, resins in that actually promote burning. So this ecosystem 
is really dependent on burning. So it burns and then it comes back. And then uh, five years later, it burns and then it comes back. But when people live there, they don't want it to burn every five years. So they do things to stop the fire. And that's what has happened for the last 50 years. And now we have these huge fires. So, um, but that is the chaparral. So they, the chaparral burns, you know, everybody knows it's an ecosystem that burns, but people like to live there because of the climate. So we're, and it's getting worse and worse because the summers are getting hotter and drier and things like that. So that is chaparral. But this technically doesn't look like chaparral because they stopped the burning and these bushes have gotten bigger and bigger. All right. Um, okay. So um, this is tempered deciduous forest and this is where we live. And deciduous trees basically look different at each, at each season. So in the winter, they have lost their leaves and this is adaptation to the cold, right? And then in the spring, they grow their leaves back and sometimes they bloom in the spring or not, depending on what tree it is. And then this is the summer where it's doing most of its photosynthesis. This is when it's really doing a lot of photosynthesis. And this is when it does a lot of transpiration. And this is why the, rock, um, the Smoky Mountains look kind of smoky because of all this. And then in the fall, the leaves start dying and change colors, and then it goes um, back to dormant. So this is a dormant season. This is the most active season, but it is called deciduous because they lose their leaves in the fall and they grow them back in the spring. And almost all the trees we see around here are deciduous. We do have some evergreens. There's pines and hemlocks and uh, anyways, okay. So this is the taiga or the boreal forest, and these are conifer trees. So these are the, and these are these, so the deciduous trees will outcompete them. So these grow further north where the deciduous trees don't do as well. Um, so these would be the larches, the spruces, the firs, um, the pines, hemlocks, uh, things like that. So they generally, they produce uh, pine cones and they don't flower. So these are, uh, these evolved before the deciduous trees evolved. Deciduous trees are angiosperms, uh, but these are further north. They're, these are north of the temperate deciduous forest. And then you have above the boreal forest, you have the tundra, which is basically a cold desert. And this is above the tree line. So you really only have um, smaller things uh, growing here. So, but this is where the, um, the big herds of uh, reindeer are and caribou. Okay, so um, this is the last section. This is aquatic and marine biomes. By the end of this section, you will be able to describe the effects of abiotic factors in the composition of plant and animal communities in aquatic biomes, compare the characteristics of ocean zones, and summarize the characteristics of standing water and flowing water in freshwater biomes. Um, and again, we're going to talk about productivity here. So wetlands or in estuaries is basically where the ocean, where the rivers dump into the ocean. They are highly productive. Lake and, lakes and streams are somewhat productive. Continental shelf is somewhat productive. Open oceans are actually the least production, the least productive. Um, another example would be hydrothermal vents. So these are deep into the ocean and these where these warm water comes out of it. And there's also sulfur and other nutrients in there. And then there's a whole ecosystem that can actually support that. Um, the interesting thing is they, gen they don't get very much sun and so you can see they don't have very much color because there's no reason to invest in color if there's no sun. So they actually are chemoautotrophic, which means they get their organic matter a different way than besides through the food chain. And these are the levels of the ocean. And I'm going to tell you, I don't expect you to know these. So I'll tell you that. You don't have to know these. Uh, but this is intertidal. And um, so that would be over here. Right. So at high tide, they have water at low tide. They don't. And that was where we did the um, not all species are equal, where he threw the starfish out in the ocean. That was when we did trophic cascades. Um, these are coral reefs. So these are highly productive. 
so that would be in this zone right here, right? So these, it, it is found in the photo, photic zone because, or because it has to have um, light. So, um, and basically they're made out of calcium carbonate. This is an estuary. And so this is where uh, fresh water and salt water meet. And these are generally, so here's where the river is coming out and it's actually going into the ocean. So these are generally highly, highly, highly productive. And there's usually wetlands around here, uh, around the edges of it. Um, but this is actually um, the uh, estuary in for the Mississippi River. So the Mississippi River is coming down here. Here's New Orleans and it dumps into the Ohio River. But again, I already told you that the Mississippi River is carrying all kinds of um, toxins and fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides from the um, agriculture that's being done up in the Midwest. So actually we have completely destroyed this um, estuary and there's a huge dead zone here now. So anyways, but there's lots and lots of, um, there's lots and lots of, uh, used to be lots and lots of wetlands and things like that. And there was high biodiversity. And what they did was they actually cut them all down and then they were growing sugar here. And then when the hurricane comes in, it washes all the sand away. So now New Orleans is more exposed when they get those hurricanes. You know, it's kind of complicated. All right. Um, so um, uncontrolled uh, growth of algae in the water rate has, has resulted in algae blooms. Um, so if you ever like have been around like a car wash or something where there's a lot of water gets um, discharged and a lot of soap used to have phosphate in it. So around car washes is extremely lush, right? And it, it grows algae and things like that because they get all those nutrients. So that's actually not good because this is eutrophication. So when the algae dies, it's going to... Um, take up all the oxygen, it's going to kill all the fish. So not, not, nothing can really live in here. It's a dead, it's basically dead. Rivers and streams. So these are rivers and streams. These are also not very productive. Wetlands are highly productive. So these are bald cypress or cypress trees. They have the knobs. These are actually um, adapted to live in water. Um, these are bromeliads. So they actually live on the sides of the trees. Um, these are in the Everglades. So there's all kinds of different wetlands that you can see, but they are highly productive. So basically what they did in the Everglades is they tried to drain the Everglades uh, to make more agriculture. And then they had all these flooding problems and water pollution problems. So then they decided that wasn't a good idea. So now they're actually trying to um, restore the Everglades. So they're trying to undo what they did. And I'll just show you uh, this. This is uh, biomagnification and bioaccumulation. And this is from your book. Um, and so this is uh, PCBs, which are um, toxic and they come from plastic. And um, so basically if it gets into the phytoplankton, which is algae, and then things eat the algae like the zebra mussel and the amphipod, and then the white sucker eats that and it gets more of those PCBs. And then this fish eats that fish and then the PCBs gets more concentrated. And then these fish eat this fish and then it gets more concentrated and this fish actually has the highest concentration. So that's basically why you're, they tell you if you're pregnant, you shouldn't eat fish at the top of the food chain like tuna is a good example um, because it has a lot of toxins in them. Particularly when you're pregnant, they tell you not to eat fish at the top of the food chain like tuna. And this is just another example. So PCBs are released from multiple sources into the Puget Sound. Um, so the phytoplankton absorb it, which is this right here, the algae. And then the zooplankton, which would be something like a zebra mussel, would eat the phytoplankton, right? And so now it's getting more concentrated. You're looking at the little red dots. And then this herring will eat the zooplankton. And then he has, has more red dots in him. He has more PCBs in him. Then the salmon will eat the herring and he is concentrated. And salmon is another one that you shouldn't eat when you're pregnant. And then um, here's this orca would actually eat him and he could have higher levels of, so that's biomagnification. You, call, you can call it bioaccumulation. There's a slight difference, but I'm not gonna worry about that here. 
So anyways, okay. And that's it. That's it for this one. So um, the next one will be on carbon cycle and we will spend a little bit of time on the carbon cycle.